Um, hi, uh, excuse me, sir, uh, hello, anyone, anyone at all? I asked randomly to a crowd of people who looked very busy and rushed at the airport in San Francisco. I was out of my element and completely lost. This was my first time navigating an airport and it felt like I was in a foreign country. I walked past signs that had words like concourse, terminal, and gate on it. I was 17 years old, traveling alone and looking for the airplane that would take me to Florida. I eventually found someone in a uniform who guided me to my gate. I was told to wait there until they called my group number, whatever that meant. I stood there, tense and nervous, looking around and trying to blend in. Could people tell that this was my first flight experience on a commercial airplane as an adult? I then looked around and quickly realized that nobody was paying attention to me. The first time I ever flew in an airplane was when my family left Afghanistan as refugees and settled in California. We flew on Pan Am from Pakistan with a layover in Japan and then made it to San Francisco. For most of the flight, I was held by my dad. I was only a few months old, nestled in his arms. However, at one point, my dad opened his eyes suddenly from a nap and found me on the floor calmly sleeping. Apparently, I fell from his lap and I didn't make a peep. To feel better about being dropped as a child, I now tell people that when I fell, that was the moment I fell in love with aviation. I didn't cry because I was comforted by the airplane. I eventually found myself on board the airplane that would take me to Florida, sitting in the back in a middle seat on a Delta Airlines flight. Luckily, I figured out how to put on my seatbelt, which also looked so foreign to me. I glanced across the person sitting next to me and I looked out the window. It was a Kodiak moment. To put this phrase in relevant terms, it was an Instagrammable moment. The sun was rising over the airport on this foggy, cool morning and I saw airplanes taxiing around. It was romantic and I could feel myself being lured by the beauty of aviation. What was happening to me in this strange land they call an airport? I felt the acceleration as we rolled down the runway and the takeoff was gentle yet so thrilling. I remember looking out the window again and seeing the small city that I grew up in. Is that all there is? I asked myself. My eyes glued to the window. I found myself in an uplifting environment, moving forward to a new and exciting destination. Up until this point, I was happily settled with the idea that I was going to follow in my mother's footsteps in becoming a housewife. But as we were flying, the aviation bug found its place in the depths of my heart and it bit me. And from that moment on, I knew I had to become a pilot. Even though I didn't have a dollar to my name or an education to support my newfound love, I knew I had to find a way. Life will open a door for you especially at a time where you may be content, happy, and stable. And yet, that door may find you when you're feeling stuck, unsatisfied, and just tired. It's up to you to open that door, to act on passion, embrace the uncertainty, 
and be uncomfortable. Pivot if your heart desires it, no matter the circumstances. Today's episode is brought to you by our sponsor, Atlantic Aviation. Atlantic Aviation provides aircraft ground support in over 60 locations across the U.S. I am proud to be partnered with a company that puts their people first and values diversity and inclusion. Their vision and mission is evident through the various resource programs they support. Experience the Atlantic attitude today. Check out AtlanticAviation.com to see all 60 plus locations and plan your next visit. It is estimated that more than 15 million and counting U.S. workers have left their job since April of 2021. People are reacting to their unsatisfaction at work or their desires to pursue something different. How do you take the leap? cope with the transitions, and pursue your true career ambitions. Today, we will be speaking with Kaya Ehrlich, who has pivoted a few times in her career in aviation to find the job that would make her skyrocket. Kaya is a pilot, a STEM advocate, and a leader in aviation. Currently, Kaya is the Director of Astronaut and NASA Sales at Blue Origin. Hi, Kaya. Welcome to the Aviate with Shasta podcast. Hi, Shasta. It's great to be here. Thank you for joining us. Um, What is one personal thing that you would like for people to know about you? One personal thing, I am wildly passionate about aviation, and Mm -hmm. it's in my blood. I think it's obvious if you see me on Twitter or social media. um, Yeah feel like I was born with it and um, just love spreading the uh, word of aviation to the rest of the community and getting more young people involved because I'm tired of being one of the few women in aviation. Oh gosh, I hear ya. <laughs> um, absolutely. You're a true av geek at heart. I've been following you for a couple of years now and um, you can just tell when you're around aviation, you are in your happy place. Um, So on August 19th, on the National Aviation Day, you tweeted, my childhood dream was to become the first and only pilot in my family. My flight path in aviation cleared me direct to the cosmos, working with NASA. Chase your dream with full throttle. And I have to say, Kaya, that was a beautiful tweet. I mean, spot on. And I'm actually going to use it to kind of frame our conversation today. Um, uh, and, and so kind of starting from the beginning of your tweet where you talk about your childhood of becoming the first and only pilot in your family, um, I think we can go ahead and get started and talk about the early years. It sounds good. All right. So you were introduced to aviation at a young age by your dad, who was a public school teacher and a history buff. Can you describe the moment where you made up your mind in pursuing a career in aviation? That moment where you're like, this is it. I'm going for it. I was really young and we were at an air show down, I believe, in the Ventura Camarillo area. And at Camarillo Airport, there was a constellation, a Connie, that was based there. And I remember we camped out with our chairs right underneath the wing of the Connie. And that's where... I think it infected me (laughs) and that's where I got the bug. Um, I fell in love with that airplane. And what happened was every time we would drive up and down um, the 101 freeway past Camarillo airport, when I was playing soccer, I'd point out the Connie, I'd look for the triple tail and I'd point it out. And I said, one day I'm going to fly. One day I'm going to fly. And we kept driving past it. So that quickly became kind of my inspiration. My dad loved B-17s. That's his favorite airplane. He was a history teacher. So 
um, and PE teacher as well, but he really, really loved World War II history, and particularly um, the aircraft side of things. So that kind of got me inspired, but nobody in my family knew anything about aviation. My dad had a good friend who was a Delta pilot, um, but that's it. it, it no, nobody knew anything. My mom was a, a public school, or, um, a, a nurse in a hospital, and they just you know, let me explore and challenge me to do anything I wanted. So driving up and down that 101 freeway, looking at Camarillo Airport with the triple tail of the Connie sticking out yeah. uh, is when I knew for sure I had the bug. Very nice. And did you want to fly professionally for like the airlines or corporate or was it just that you wanted to fly? I wanted to fly. I had no idea what I wanted to do in aviation. I thought I wanted to design and build airplanes. So I thought, aerospace engineering. I had spent some time at Cal Poly uh, University as a kid uh, with some of the women engineers who were great mentors. And I thought for sure I was on that path. And yeah. I didn't know or realize all the different opportunities in aviation that exceed engineering, that exceed flying. Um, and I just got really fortunate where I started looking at aviation programs and I found one that actually um, was an aviation major with a business focus. And I thought, well, this is an interesting way to impact an industry that I'm so passionate about from a totally different end. Right. Well, I want to kind of get into that. But before we do, um, I grew up in California, too, in Richmond, uh, which is up north near the Bay Area. Um, and my school district was not fully or well-funded. Um, so just to give you some perspective, uh, we often didn't have textbooks to take home. Um, we had like a rotation of substitute teachers because our school just couldn't keep teachers there. And um, at one point, our elementary school was shut down because they just didn't have any funding to keep it going. And as a child or as a kid, you know, I didn't have a lot of aspirations. I thought like, you know, I'm originally from Afghanistan. My mom's a housewife. Her mother was a housewife. Generationally, women are housewives from where I come from. So I'm going to naturally do the same after high school. Um, so when the funding was cut, you know, I thought, well, oh, well, you know, it doesn't make a difference to me. And in hindsight, I look back and I think, like, oh, my gosh, that wasn't OK. You know, luckily, I did find aviation and, um, you know, went to a university and, and got my my flight training and all that done. Uh, but like, but now I realize how um, it was very hard for me to study and like understand science and um, aerodynamics and so on. And from your story, uh, you uh, once mentioned that in high school, you felt like you weren't being challenged enough. So you enrolled in the Endeavor Academy, which is a STEM program sponsored by NASA. Uh, the program, unfortunately, was terminated due to budget cuts. But you you were encouraged to pivot and start your flight lessons. You wanted more STEM. What caused you to not accept those odds and continue to find pathways in STEM, especially because you were only 16 years old? Yeah, I was really burnt out uh, in advanced placement classes, AP classes. I had a hard time understanding why we had to work so hard, and then we also had to take a test, and maybe the colleges would accept that past exam uh, for college credit. And I thought, you know, I just wasn't getting the material that I wanted. I didn't want to study to take a test. I wanted to study to benefit my career and my future. And when the Endeavor Academy was being threatened um, for budget cuts, we fought so hard. We went to the school board. We got on the news. Um, it was such a wonderful program. And we were just outside of Vandenberg Air Force Base. So what better um, STEM education than to have Vandenberg in your backyard growing up watching rocket launches? Yeah. And unfortunately, it was just the, the way of the times. And they cut it. And I thought, well, I don't want to keep taking, you know, AP history, AP English. It wasn't for me. I wanted science. There was AP physics. Um, and there were a couple other things. But I wanted something that would prepare me for a career in aviation. And so I was fortunate enough to start taking flying lessons at 16. I, I had to make the tough call because flying lessons were not cheap. Yeah. <laughs> um, I ate into my college tuition uh, to start to learn how to fly. 
and ended up needing to supplement that with junior college classes while I was still in high school to save money on the back end of college because there was no way I could afford to play for flying lessons and then go to a four-year university. So yeah. while I was in high school, I was doing college classes and flying at the same time. Ended up knocking out high school um, two years ahead of my class. And then I came in as a junior to college uh, to the four-year university, which saved a lot of money. But it also kept that passion alive because I was immersed in those technical classes that I was so passionate about. And right. um, that really kind of just kept me propelling um, and moving forward. Wow. That's really smart of you to do that. Um, but that really shows how passionate you are about aviation, even as young as 16. Um, so you earned a bachelor's degree in aviation management business administration from Auburn University. And upon graduating, you were very fortunate enough to find um, work at the Phoenix Sky Harbor International Airport. What was your career aspirations at the time? I uh, thought about this question last night. I sat with yeah. my fiance and I read it out loud and I told him he never heard this story. Yeah. I almost became a TSA agent. <laughs> Oh, wow. When I graduated, and he's kind of giggling right now. When I graduated, um, I graduated in the recession. Uh -huh. Nobody was hiring. Nobody wanted a recent college grad. And aviation was such a weird but cool major. And I searched high and low for any sort of aerospace job. And no one told me when I was in college because I had flown past. I was only in college for two years. I didn't have time to do an internship. I had taken classes all summer long to save money. I didn't understand the benefit of interning while you were in college. And so I didn't have any work experience other than, you know, jobs here and there from high school that weren't applicable in the industry. Um, and I happened to come across a graduate um, internship at Phoenix Sky Harbor International Airport. And I threw my name in the hat in the middle of the recession again. They told me that I was one of like 2,000 applicants or something. Wow. I think. Um, and this is my crazy theory. The reason why my resume kind of stuck out was I went to Auburn University for my undergrad and we had just won the national championship in Phoenix for football. And so I think the airport was used to seeing Auburn and they thought, hmm, this is interesting. <laughs> and then perhaps they saw like my passion for aviation after yeah. that. But you always need those resume things that, that help kind of rise to the top, whether they're luck or whether they're keywords. But um, that is how I got my foot in the door yeah. in aviation. But otherwise, like, it was abysmal, abysmal. Like I, like, a, again, I, I was looking at TSA agent in Molokai. <laughs> like wow. We were, we were scraping, we were scraping to find anything to get yeah. me into the aviation industry. So I was really fortunate to get that internship, but um, you got to start somewhere. Right. You do. And the reason why we're talking about pivoting um, your passions is because you know, as you can imagine with the pandemic, so many people are um, changing careers, you know, trying something different. And it is, there's a lot of uncertainties that go with that. Uh, but more specifically, there are a lot of women who are pivoting. And it's great to hear from you, you know, how you went through your career um, and the, the, the decisions that you made and what helped you and what didn't. Um, so with that, I want to start talking about you going from Sky Harbor over to Honeywell. Um, can you talk about a little bit about what inspired you to leave a job that you excelled at? Um, you had experience in uh, operations, capital management, public relations, um, but you across the airport, you saw the Honeywell Boeing 757 flying tech lab, and that inspired you to go and do something different. Can you share that story with us? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I determined pretty early on when I was at the airport, amazing place, amazing people like my family, but everybody could tell me, including folks that weren't much older than me, exactly to the day when they could retire. And I thought, are these people working just to retire? Maybe some, um, some really did love being there. But I thought, what kind of environment is this for me Yeah, just working to retire? Um, and I wanted something. I'm a competitive person. I played soccer my whole life. I'm always in a hurry, like, let's go, let's dig in, let's dive. And government work just didn't fit me. 
And so I started looking for opportunities and Honeywell was across the runway. They were kind of like the bad boy at the time. There was an environmental remediation site there. It was actually, it's actually a super fun site um, a long time ago on the side of the airport. And so I was working in the environmental department at the airport and they kind of had this stigma and it was mysterious. There was steam mm-hmm. coming out of the um, engine test cells. There was a tank over there. I think it was an M1 Abrams tank. And I was like, God, what is behind those barbed wire fences? Yeah. I, I got to know, and I got to know what the private sector is like. I'd always dreamt of working in a major OEM, and that was my chance. So they actually had, I, I was working on my master's degree at the time, and they had a, uh, a master's degree internship within their product and marketing team uh, in the engines facility. So literally in the building that I was staring at every single day at the airport. So I asked the airport if I could work um, four tens, which is four days a week, but 10 hour days. And on my day off, while I was working on my MBA, I uh, interned at Honeywell. And so I had one foot in one door and one foot in the other door. And that's how I kept going. And I don't recommend working two jobs and doing your master's degree at the same time, but it enabled me to really see all sides of the spectrum before I made the, the big leap and went to Honeywell permanently. Wow. Oh my goodness. Um, what would, would you say is the, was the most difficult part of transitioning from, you know, stability, something that you were comfortable with, something that you, you knew and you were really good at over to trying something new? I firmly believe that if you're not uncomfortable, you're not growing. Yeah. And the day that you realize you're really comfy in your job and you're really good at it, you're not, you're not achieving your best self. You, you, you hit a, a good peak, but you got to keep climbing that mountain. Um, you can't stop. So I, because I had one foot in the door at one place and one foot in the door at the other place, I really got to see both sides at the same time. Right. And I realized that my future would just have more diversity. Um, I would be able to grow and learn quicker and move around different departments uh, at Honeywell versus staying at the airport. So I made the tough call. It came with tears. I had a hard time leaving. Um, They were like my family at the airport, and I still stay in touch with a lot of them. Um, But making that huge leap when you're uncomfortable to do so is is those moments where you're growing the fastest. And never be afraid. You're not growing unless you're uncomfortable. Yeah, well said. Um, This is somewhat of a trend with millennials um, that we're seeing who – these millennials are not wanting the traditional 30 year, like climb the ladder type jobs. Do you have an idea why there is this shift? I have a theory and I think it's because we millennials, when we entered the workplace, we were given opportunities way beyond our years. Um, It was a unique time when a lot of our our superiors were starting to retire Mm -hmm. and there was a little bit of an age gap. I was one of the only millennials and definitely one of the only young women in the entire engines building at Honeywell for quite a while. And I was given opportunities way above my experience, way above my years. And it was just because there was nobody else. Um, There was no one else to grow. And so there was a bit of an age gap there where um, I was propelled faster in my career than I think generations before me were ever given the chance. And I think it's not unique to millennials to feel like they don't want to climb the ladder. I think it's an an age gap where millennials were giving the career opportunities much quicker. They climbed much faster um, than generations before them. And they're starting to see the view at the top is not really any better. It comes with more sacrifice from family life. And I think because we've gotten a taste of it, we've decided what are really our priorities in life versus generations before us had worked so hard to finally get there. They were later on in their career. So a uh, little too late to, to perhaps change or make those decisions. We're seeing the writing on the wall kind of as we're growing up. Yeah, that's very good perspective. Um, I think that theory is, is spot on. Um, just to share with you, Kaya, when I first went into aviation, I wanted to be an airline pilot And um, as I started to progress in my flight training, I actually interned with Alaska Airlines. I did their chief pilot internship and I got, had a lot of jump seating privileges. Um, I did the milk run in Alaska 
And it was an incredible experience. But, you know, I walked away from it thinking, I don't know if I want to be an airline pilot. I don't think it's for me. And I looked into corporate aviation. I even thought about joining the military. I went out to Alaska to talk to the recruitment team there. Um, and like I kept coming back to I, I want to fly around the world and share the message to young kids that if they put their uh, mind to it, whatever it is that they want to do, whether it's in aviation and STEM or anywhere else, they can achieve it. Um, Because I I had felt that once I got into aviation and I felt very empowered and I just kept coming back to this um, desire to go around the world and share aviation with children. And I I kept coming back to, well, this job description doesn't exist. And one day it dawned on me. I thought, well, if it doesn't exist, I have to go create it. Um, So I did that through my nonprofit. But, you know, I think millennials are starting to learn that there's so many different ways to do something nowadays. And, um, you know, back a generation before us, people had a sense of duty to do things or it was just the, th- the thing to do. Whereas this generation, um, we're, we're uh, applying our passions to what we want to do, which I think is really exciting. Absolutely. And the opportunities that are afforded to our generation are light years beyond generations before us. So right. in an essence, we are spoiled and we are fortunate for the opportunities given to us. Um, and I think yeah. that's that's bred a little bit different of a culture, but thank goodness as well, because we're really starting to put into perspective, family life is important and you know your job never defines you. Your career, perhaps it's a big part of you, but an individual title or a job will never define you and it will never exactly. make you happy until you are whole as a person. And that includes family life at home. Oh, man, you said it. That's very well said. A big learning lesson for me, too, that I realized that your career can change, but, you know, family, that's forever. Um, And so you got to lean or lead with that. Uh, So very well said. I I now want to talk about, you know, after you your time at Honeywell, um, you were uh, a rock star. I mean, I remember going to Honeywell's headquarters and everyone was like, oh, you have to meet Kaya. She is incredible. She's a leader. She's doing so many great things. Um, and to me, I thought, wow, she's, you know, she's established. One day she's probably going to be the CEO of Honeywell. Um, but surprisingly, you pivoted again. And now you find yourself um, at Blue Origins. Origin, sorry. How did you find yourself in the aerospace industry? So aerospace, as you know very well, Shasta, is a tight-knit community. That's how you and I know each other. There's not many of us. Um, Hopefully there will be more in the future, but we are a tight, close family, and the importance of networking is critical. Mm -hmm. And I was fortunate to have worked with some folks that are now at Blue Origin, and we had worked together at Honeywell. Um, And I leaned on on a few just for advice on, hey, I'm, I've, I've hit the point in my career where I'm leading a big team. I've had numerous responsibilities. I'm on this upward trajectory uh, for a high level leadership position at the company. Yeah. And it wasn't, I, I had this, <laughs> I had this really interesting trip. Okay. So it all started where I was asked to be the keynote speaker at Space Camp. Um, and this was when I was at Honeywell and Honeywell gave me incredible speaking experiences all over the place, but this was the one that changed my life. And I flew out to space camp. I didn't know anything about space other than growing up near Vandenberg. Um, yeah. it was not attainable to me. I didn't pursue it. And statistically you have a higher chance of becoming a rock star than an astronaut. And That's the sad true. thing is I just, I set my altitude lower at, at aviation and, and there's nothing wrong with that, but yeah. I just didn't think space was attainable. Um, yeah. and I was sitting at space camp, loved my job, loved Honeywell. And I'm watching these high schoolers dance under the Saturn five. Um, this was after giving the commencement speech and I was telling them about how you should follow your passion. You should never be afraid to be curious and to change. And I'm thinking, and I'm watching them dance after my speech going, am I really living and practicing what I preach? 
Oh, wow. Um, and it was the first time I felt old in my life. Um, <laughs> I was the oldest one, one of the oldest ones in the room. And I thought, am I really practicing what I preach? How can I go inspire these kids if I'm truly not living what I'm saying? Right. And ironically enough, the next day I met my fiance on the flight home. And oh, wow. that was when I decided, can I, how do I get into space? And so I started leaning on that network in, in aviation of what do I need to learn? Do I need to go back to school? I already had two degrees. I had a master's degree in aviation as well. Loved flying. Didn't want to leave the airplane side of things. Um, and <laughs> I just got the advice of take your experience, all of the, the cross-functional experiences that you had, and come to a new industry. Just make the jump. Do your homework. Yeah. Start studying. Start reading. There's the um, SMAD behind me. That's the engineering bible for space. And and eventually you'll get there, you know, just keep applying, keep trying. And that's essentially what I did. I, I started teaching myself rocket science. I Googled everything I could. I started reading engineering books and I started thinking hard about how could I take all of my business experience from Honeywell and the aviation industry side and apply it to space. And so it's been a steep learning curve and I'm yeah. still going and I'm still learning, but um, it's kind of how I tried to bridge the gap was taking that cross-functional experience and then learning a whole new industry. How did you um, work on building the confidence to go into something that you originally growing up thought that you, you couldn't do, go to space or be a part of um, the space sector? Like, where did that confidence come from? Was it just that you wanted to do something different that challenged you that, um, or was it like, like we're, I'm just trying to understand where did that confidence come from for you to just go out there and, and go after this job? <laughs> I was not originally confident. I was okay. just hungry. Yeah. I was hungry for change. I was hungry for jumping into a brand new industry that's growing and booming. And I always like to compare it to uh, the golden age of aviation. Mm -hmm. If I could go back in time, and have my choice of any period to work in, it would be the golden age of aviation to leave my mark on history on an industry that I love and I'm so passionate about. But I missed that boat. And yeah. I really look at space as kind of that next step. It's the next golden age of aviation. We're starting commercial space travel. We're opening the accessibility to space to people from around the world, from all different backgrounds. You don't have to be a rock star uh, astronaut to go to space. You don't have to be the fittest person to go to space. I mean, just opening that aperture to so many people is kind of what's propelling me now to think I'm, 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 I'm here helping make history. Um, and this is my chance to have that kind of, um, touch on the golden age of now space. Right. With that, I want to ask you, uh, Blue Origin made history on July 20th, as I'm sure many people know, uh, where they launched the new Shepard carrying four passengers to subor suborbital space. Where were you on launch day and what were some of the emotions that you were feeling? I was actually home in Arizona. Um, okay. I set my alarm clock really early and I got up and started watching Ariane Cornell, who's our great webcast host and one of my peers I get to work with. And um she starts the webcast, you know, we've all been like dying to see it, right? Yeah. And my whole family is watching too. Everyone starts texting me. And um I you know, I, the actual flight piece, I was that was that was cool. That was normal. We had seen, you know, 15 consecutive flights before that. Yeah. Um where I got really emotional and started tearing up was seeing our chief designer Gary Lai who was um, speaking to Ariane during the webcast, and he was talking about the team of at Blue that made this happen. And yeah, I it was a very humbling experience for me because here I am two and a half years into the company, and I get to be involved in this. And yeah. here Gary is um, talking about people that have dedicated their entire career, uh, years and years at Blue for this one special day. Um, and so I started tearing up because it. We're such a tight family um, and such an amazing peer group that um, we all kind of had this emotional, universal feeling, right? It, it didn't matter right. if we were next to each other at um, our, our Kent headquarters in Washington or down at the launch site. 
you felt an initial, you felt like an immediate tie to all folks at Blue. It was one Blue family moment. It was a bit emotional. So yeah, watching Gary Lai talk about the team, I teared up. And then of course, at the end during the winging ceremony, um, seeing Wally get her wings at yeah. 82 years old was just um, spectacular. So um, I humbling agree. to be a part of it and so I have to pinch myself every day that, hey, we're making history and we've got another one coming up really soon. So um, let's get more people the space. Yeah. Oh, that's a beautiful story. Thank you for sharing it. And I have to say, I've met Wally Funk and uh, I think it was at Sun and Fun so many years ago. And that passion for her to go to space, it was there and, and you know, I hate to say this, but I thought, oh, gosh, you know, like, I hope you will someday, but I don't know if we're there yet. Um, So to to hear and see that she, you know, went to space, to me, that was the ultimate American dream. Like, here we are going to suborbital space. And then not only that, but a big dreamer, a big passionate woman who's accomplished a lot in aviation finally gets to have this opportunity. I mean, it was just like a beautiful story and and I'm so happy for her. Yeah, I mean, who doesn't love Wally Funk? Um, I know. <laughs> I'll be honest. Yes. I when it was announced and I found out it was Wally, I didn't know who that was. I'm oh, no. so embarrassed. Here I am. That's now. all right. A woman in aviation. How did I not know who Wally Funk was? How have I not heard her story? Um, yeah. And I, I think back to that is it really highlights the need to bring these icons into the spotlight. Right. Wally is Wally is an icon not only in aviation but in space and in the period of time when women just couldn't do what women can do now. Um, yeah. And she was one of the ones that charged forward and made things possible for you and I. And so I was embarrassed. I had to Google it. I started reading her story. I was down a rabbit hole. I think I stopped working for the day just to study Wally Funk. Um, yeah. And funny enough, one of my former colleagues from Panasonic had uh, mailed me her book, Wally Funk's Race to Space. And I hadn't gotten around to reading it yet. Uh, okay. I am a super slow reader. And I thought, oh my <laughs> God, Kaya, you got it. <laughs> you got to get, get on this. Um, yeah. And so needless to say, that shot to number one and uh, yeah. a huge Wally fan now. But You know, I don't blame you, Kaya, because even for me, when I decided I wanted to fly around the world, I had no idea that, you know, after Amelia Earhart, seven other women successfully flew around the world in a single engine or a GA aircraft. And again, I I asked myself, how do we not know about these women? Um, So I think the industry does, you know, a fair job promoting um, Amelia Earhart. uh, But the the narrative is a little sad. It's like, oh, Amelia Earhart started the 99s, first woman um, in the U.S. to get a license. But then she got lost. You know, it's just like, come on, really? Is that the best we can do in terms of promoting the pioneers in this industry. Um, so I don't blame you for not knowing Wally Funk. I think um, you weren't alone when she was announced for, you know, people in our industry asking, you know, who is she? Uh, but part of what I'm trying to do with this podcast is introduce aviation to the icons um, that we have in our industry and share their stories so that we're not stuck with just, you know, Amelia Earhart and this narrative that she you got lost. Um, so, Yeah. I, I don't blame you. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I think back to elementary school. We did yeah. a like a, a miniature school play. My mom had to build this giant airplane that we sat in. And we played Amelia Earhart. And I'm okay. thinking, great. Why couldn't that have been Wally Funk? Why couldn't we True. have portrayed Wally? Why couldn't we have portrayed the Mercury 13 or all of the aviation um, and women icons back in the day. Why was it always Amelia? So um, nothing, yeah. nothing wrong with, with sharing that legacy, but she is not the only one. Um, and so that's yeah. what I love about this podcast is bringing to light those icons that really do deserve to be recognized at a much broader and higher uh, level. Thank you. So we've talked a lot here about um, these major pivot points in your life. I now want to dive deeper and uh, give our listeners some more perspective of um, how you were able to be successful uh, through your 
um, journey. Uh, but before I get into that, I want to start off with a quote um, that Sheryl Sandberg once said, and it was in terms of career planning. Uh, so Sheryl said that in, in terms of career planning, don't draw a straight line. It will be boring and you are going to miss all the good stuff because all the good stuff is currently being invented. Um, I, I feel like you could relate to this <laughs> more than anybody, um, but having the experiences that you had in your career, which was not a straight line, um, would you agree with what Cheryl had said in this quote? Absolutely. Um, there, the, the meetings I hated the most um, throughout my career were the career planning ones. Kaya, mm -hmm. draw out your career plan. Well, what do you want to be in five years? What do you want to be in 10 years? I hate that interview question. Um, and it happens a lot. I don't know. And that's okay to not know. I know what I love and I know what I'm good at and I know the gaps that I want to go fill, but I don't have that job or that title in mind anymore. I used to say, well, I want to be CEO of an aviation company. That's totally changed now. Um, I don't know. Like, and yeah. so that's, that's the beauty of, of a career is it's fluid. It goes and ebbs and flows as you progress and you grow and you learn. And it's okay to not know what job you want in five years or where you want to be or what you want to do. What's important right. to know is who you are, what you're passionate about, and what are the skills and the general areas that you want to make an impact on in life. And throw the job title away because it doesn't matter anyways. Yeah. Oh, very good. Throughout these pivot points, what was unexpectedly one of the toughest parts for you? You know, I thought long and hard about this and I, it's, it, it hurts me to say that there were women that I encountered throughout my career that did not want me to succeed. And I yeah. thought, looking back at it, gosh, how, how uh, we as women, there's so few of us in aviation and in an aerospace that how could they not want us all to succeed? Why are we not banded together as a sisterhood trying to help each other? And I thought long and hard about this. And the only thing I could come up with is, you know, because we're so rare that perhaps other women takes away that rarity. And it just made me so, so, so sad that I had yeah. to encounter that throughout my career that that was one of my biggest um, uh, hangups was just trying to understand why were there women in particular that did not want me to succeed and tried to kind of throw a wrench into that when all I wanted um, was in doing STEM outreach and, and other things was to bring more young girls into this industry. I was so tired of being the only woman in the room. I was right. so tired of sometimes being the only woman on the floor. And yeah. I didn't want to be a novelty, but I was. I was a young woman. I was a novelty. I was rare. And there weren't a lot of us. Yeah. And I'm tired of that. And I was tired of that. And I was one of the, the drivers in doing a lot of STEM outreach um, in my prior roles was to bring more women in. So it made me really, really sad to encounter some of those people that I think are just missing the big picture. Um, they're yeah. focused on, you know, climbing that ladder um, versus what the mission is and what we're doing together as humanity. So when I came to Blue, I could not believe that it's the norm to sit on meetings where it's all women. I yes. love it. Like, <laughs> I am not a novelty. I am right. I am not the youngest. I'm not the only woman. There is There's nothing unique or special about me. I'm just Kaya, and I'm in a sea of amazing, diverse talent at Blue. So that's what I particularly love about the space industry is yeah. it's light years ahead, I think, of aviation. Aviation has made a lot of progress, but it's not there yet, you know? Right. It's just not there. You know, there are two things that I want to kind of add to what you just said. Um, I feel like because people who are in aviation, they're in it because they love it. They're very passionate people. So when you do come across individuals who are, you know, not very supportive of you and, it, you know, if you're not supportive, that's fine. But then they go after you with an agenda. It hurts unlike no other. Um, and it's happened to me. And I've told myself, you know, I know who I am. I know what I'm doing. I don't need to be bothered by this, but it still impacts you. And the second thing I want to say is, 
um, you know, I've, I've done a handful of interviews and I'm finding that there are, you know, with most women, they have a mean girl group that they kind of had to deal with throughout their career. And it, it's so sad. It's like, you really don't get it. This is such an incredible industry. We need more diversity. Do you want to be the only woman in the room or, um, or the only woman to, to, to represent, um, women in general? I mean, it, it just, they don't get the picture and it's so sad. And I mean, I, I, I find that those women usually don't get very far in life, which is sad for them too. Cause we, as women need to rise and, serve in more leadership positions. So I can sympathize with what you're saying. Yeah, the, the, the things that we can do together far exceed the things that we would do or change alone. Um, Absolutely. So you know, I, I'm hoping for change and I'm hoping that the message starts to spread that um, those women that are out there that have encountered that, yeah. you're not alone. You're right. not alone. Reach out to reach out to other people that, um, you know, we've all experienced something. We all have that really passionate story of when, you know, we came home from work in tears, bawling. Um, there were right. lots of times I did that. I, one time I sat under my desk crying uh, because of all of the trauma that I, I faced um, yeah. being one of the only young women uh, in my career. And it was, it was a lot of pressure. And um, yeah, that, that's my message is, the more, the more you have, um, the more people that you can relate to in your work experience, the stronger you are as a team. Um, the more different faces and different opinions, um, and, and people that you can learn and lean from, the stronger you are from, as a team. If if you kind of remove that and you are that novel woman in the room, there's a whole different set of pressure on you that's not fair. It follows you. It's a stigma that follows you. And do you really want that? Um, some people yeah. might be okay with that. For me, it was, I'm so much happier being on a team where I don't stick out in any way for being a young woman at all. Like this is meaningless. It doesn't, so is everybody right. else, you know, um, I stick out cause I'm Kaya and it's just me. Right. And I, I, what a, what a different and positive environment that is. And I really flourished, um, in my happiness. My, my happiness is through the roof. Uh, just surrounded by uh, like-minded people that are all there to support each other versus climbing yeah. the ladder. Right. Oh, that's incredible. Thank you for sharing that with us. I think there are some uh, people in our audience that needed to hear that. Um, so I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, so Kaya, I feel like I could talk to you for hours, really, um, but we will wrap it up here. And I want to ask you one final question that I ask all of our guests. And that is, what is the best piece of uh, advice that you have received as a woman in aviation that has served you very well? It's to move laterally as much as you possibly can before you start climbing. So your career is a pyramid and you're building foundational blocks of cross-functional experience. And the higher you climb up that pyramid, if you go straight up, if you look to your left and you look to your right, you, there's nowhere to grow. You can yeah. only keep going up and there's fewer and fewer options. And, you know, that was a really tough pill to swallow as a, as a young career woman because I was hungry. I was competitive. I, I wanted to um, improve as much as possible and take on more responsibilities and get that next title. And it did not serve me well. I, I, I will say it did not serve me well. And it got to the point where I did end up pretty high. And I looked around and I looked to my left and I looked to my right and I said, my goodness, I'm missing these other experiences. And I've been warned about this and I didn't listen. And um, so I actually ended up taking a step back in title. Wow. I don't manage any people. Um, this is the first time I haven't managed a team in many years. And I threw title aside. I didn't care about any of that. And I am just focused on building other pieces of that, that foundational pyramid. And so it's much harder to, to go backwards um, mentally. Yeah. But I will say, when you have the opportunity to move around laterally, build out those cross-functional blocks first before you move up, because it will serve you well. It will make you a stronger leader. You'll have more experience. You will have those, quote, scars 
um, to lean back on to to give you that credibility and to give you that backbone to be a stronger and better leader. So I'm starting, I'm doing that now. I did a little bit of that prior to coming to Blue as well. And um, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what level on the pyramid you are. It's how many blocks are are um, to your left and to your right. Right. Oh, that is sound advice. Great. Well, Kaya, thank you so much again for joining us today. And uh, it's been very insightful. I'm glad I've had the opportunity to learn more about you and, and your career and keep up the great, innovative, and exciting work that you're doing. Thank you so much, Shasta. And it's just yeah. awesome to see you again. <laughs> and Sisters in Aviation, let's go make a difference. Yes, love it. All right, Kaya, thank you.